I will talk about um, some theoretical and methodological challenges posed by the rise of um, right-wing or nationalist populism. Um, now, I'm not particularly happy with that term because populism, of course, in, in implies the idea that there's some sort of similarity between right-wing and left-wing populists, and um, I really have difficulty seeing um, the common basis um, in Podemos and Syriza, for example, and, um, and something like Trump and Brexit. Um, I guess uh, we need to recognize the difference of quality in arguing, um, the difference um, in, in values. Um, I mean, is democracy accepted, uh, rational ex exchange, uh, uh, an ideal, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, um, I think there are lots of candidates in terms of concepts and terms that we can use um, to account for, for, for the rise of the phenomenon that uh, we are interested in here. And uh, there, there are some, and all of them have some limits. Um, there's, for example, fanaticism, perhaps, as, as a term, uh, perhaps conspiracy theory. Um, they all are a bit too large, too, too narrow. I want to choose uh, fascism as a term in order to account for the effective dimensions of discourse. And I think um, what, what we can see in the last few years is um, there's something happening which um, classical discourse analysis, which um, started to, to, to emerge in, in the 60s and 70s is no longer really able to capture it in, in certain ways. And I think um, the main challenge is to, to account for, yeah, for, for the non-rational, uh, the limits of reason in discourse. And um, so what, what I'd like to do here in this, um, in this talk to invite you to, um, to go through a few ideas around fascism which is certainly not uh, a phenomenon which just um, started with Trump and Brexit. Um, and also um, to think about some ideas uh, about how to account for it methodologically. Um, let me start perhaps with um, some ideas here. Do you, you can't see my presentation. Now that's, of course, something no, uh, not yet. perhaps uh, start. <laughs> okay, so the title is um, Fascism 2.0 or the effective logics in contemporary right-wing discourse. And basically, I will have two parts. The first part will be some theoretical reflections on, on the notion of fascism today in the light of these uh, developments. And the second part is um, a closer look at, um, the, um, uh, at the Reader's Forum of the Daily Mail, which is a UK newspaper, around Brexit. And uh, the question will be, to what degree do we need to account for the effective logics in these discourses here? How do I operate this here? Is this? Oh, here. OK. Yeah, um, of course, fascism has a historical model, which is the um, 1930s, and we think of Hitler and um, Mussolini as the uh, precursors uh, and the founders of, of modern fascism. And um, and and of course, um, I mean, we we know about the totalitarian uh, rules, the structures, uh, the movements, um, the uh, fanaticism, um, the ideologies that were mobilized um, at the time. And um, if we compare what's happening then and now, I mean, we do need to recognize uh, some major differences. Here on the left, you see. Um, uh, a party congress of the Nazis in Nuremberg, um, where you see big parades, spectacles, um, a great um, mise-en-scene of, um, of the nation as a homogeneous whole, um, people falling in line with the leader, with the Führer, and, uh, and all of that is very much orchestrated and you see the aesthetics of it. On the right, you see um, the March to Leave, organized by Nigel Farage in March 2019, that was uh, one and a half years ago, that was one of the deadlines for Brexit. And um, the idea was to bring um, the British people together and uh, organizing a march down to London for, for whatever deadline there was at the time. And um, you see the big difference in terms of how this was presented and how this uh, played out. Um, and of course, nowadays, um, the main thing happens uh, on social media, which is really a new kind of uh, technology and, uh, uh, and something which, uh, which uh, has changed the game, where you see individuals clicking on certain um, arousing 
um, content and then having um, a good feeling. So we see the fanaticism, the mobilization of the masses through the very individual practice of um, individual media users. And, um, and I think um, the, um, the big difference between now and then is that um, at the time uh, we had an authoritarian type of fascism where the idea was really to merge with um, um, patriarchal uh, ideas, structures uh, of the nation, uh, whereas nowadays it's much more individualistic and you see um, lots of um, hyper-liberal, uh, libertarian ideologies in play, I mean, um, uh, up to neoliberal um, uh, tendencies. And, um, and so, of course, I mean, there are huge differences in terms of how uh, these movements are organized and um, and and how they they think. But I guess still, I think there's um, a good justification to speak of fascism in both cases, um, since uh, the discursive dynamics um, and the kind of spirals in which uh, people fall into through the media um, are not that dissimilar. And that's what I wanted to um, talk about in this um, in this presentation. I've been looking around for, theories uh, to account for fascism as, as a very broad analytical term for these um, collective states of um, excitement, exception. And um, I came across microfascism as a term which I found in Deleuze Guattari, uh, Mille Plateaux, um, which I found quite helpful. It really directs our attention to um, the question of desire. And the idea of microfascism is that it's a way of deploying um, our desire to control the desire of others. Now, that's uh, maybe a bit abstract, and I'll try to um, um, give you some, some more ideas about how this can play out in the, in, in the case of fascism. Um, so the idea in Deleuze Guattari is that, in a way, um, our everyday life um, is pervaded by some um, loose fantasies, desires, affects, um, which can can be uh, expressed in very innocent acts of uh, controlling others, uh, like, for example, jaywalking um, in um, in a village when there's really no car uh, around at all, and then somebody kind of stopping you, pestering uh, against you. And um, so um, I think that's um, that's what uh, Deleuze Guattari had in mind when they talk about um, microfascism. Um, and I think they still have the idea of the authoritarian fascist of, uh, in mind, which uh, which was still much more present at the time, um, and um, where the idea is to to cite rules, institutions, structures, models that are made by others. So um, the microfascist in a way has recourse to those resources in order to control others, and um, and if we want to uh, understand how microfascism uh, works, which is a, a an identity project where people become fascist subjects in, a, in an authoritarian state, uh, in a regime that, um, that works um, um, openly uh, in a fascistic way. Um, then, of course, there's a back and fro, right, between the microfascist desires in, in everyday life and um, the macrofascist regime, where, where these things are in a way um, coalesced and they, they coagulate and uh, crystallize um, around certain ways of uh, power um, exercising. Now, of course, um, fascism, contrary to the appearance of order and um, structure, is a very an anarchical, anarchical uh, uh, regime. Uh, where basically decision making normally is unbound. Um, it's, um, um, I mean, decision making normally is very much um, obscured in order to uh, make sure the dictator has all the power to decide um, uh, in, 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 in that uh, um, very big um, uh, power machine. And, um, and so what, what I'd like to um, ask here is to what degree we should um, think about certain discursive dynamics which can lead to to desires those um, some sometimes unfocused uh, fantasies um, to be unleashed um, so that uh, people get whipped up and um, drawn sucked into certain discourses which are then exploited um, by powerful um, political actors uh, to to create um, a new way of um, 
exercising power. And, um, and so I think we need to think not only about uh, the kind of everyday practices, uh, which, uh, which are the kind of fuel or the kind of background of, um, of those macro fascist um, regimes, but we also need to, to, to talk about um, cycles um, of, of um, public discourse, which um, sometimes becomes more discivilized and sometimes less civilized. Uh, more civilized, um, and and I think uh, what happens is um, that sometimes these discursive dynamics, um, they um, they they can whip up and uh, stir up people in in quite uh, impressive ways, and uh, there are certain institutions that um, um, act as as a kind of bulwark against those uh, dynamics, and um, and of course after the war there there were various uh, institutions in the economy, for example, the welfare state, um, unions, where people had to come together. Um, they had to cooperate um, on a long-term basis. And uh, and also the media would, were organized um, in a much more centralized way um, than today. Um, and uh, so you had uh, newspapers where journalists um, had to, in a way, think about how to reflect a so-called public opinion and um, and uh, and television as well was um, a, in many European countries a quite a public um, uh, um, institution where people had to to be given some sort of balance between different points of views. Um, now there are many other um, intermediary organisations that can act as a kind of uh, civilizing institution as well. I mean, you have churches, you have all, all kinds of um, civil society uh, institutions and, and organizations. And what we can see um, over the last few decades is um, an erosion of those um, civilizing institutions in many ways and uh, the rise of um, a new uh, form of um, media, uh, social media especially, where there's no longer a need for, for intermediary um, instances like, for example, journalists and professionals who produce uh, news and circulate it in certain ways. Now, um, I think that's perhaps a first um, idea to account for fascism as a kind of cyclical phenomenon uh, where we uh, see um, periods of relative calm, uh, like after the war. Um, and we all also see, of course, other periods of excitement, of collective hysteria, uh, which are not necessarily fascist. Um, I mean, they're revolutionary periods. Um, there's uh, periods of religious fanaticism in Europe. And, um, and, uh, and there's a back and fro. And of course, theories uh, that we have um, react to those moments. And... Um, and if we need to um, to think about the, the the role of desires and affect and discourse nowadays, uh, this obviously harks back to to old work that has been done um, on on historical fascism in the 30s. And um, I want to cite um, the first generation critical theory work around fascism uh, in the Institute for Sozialforschung in Frankfurt, for example, where I mean there was a very clear um, recognition that um, uh, that fascism needs to be counted for as something that really goes beyond reason. So um, rationalistic theories um, uh, didn't really um, um, play a big role and uh, psychoanalysis was very important. In many cases articulated with historical materialism, Marxism, and, um, and that was, I think, um, the specific contribution of um, that first generation to critical theory. And I think it's really important to go back to that and um, to, um, to see what it can uh, contribute. I mean, some ideas can no longer really be, um, um, be up to date uh, for us today. Um, I mean, psychoanalysis was used uh, in a way that uh, I think most uh, more constructivist minded um, social scientists, theorists that nowadays uh, can no longer accept. I mean, uh, the idea was in many cases, um, people like uh, Reich, um, Marcuse, for example, um, that um, there's something like um, a nat nature, a human nature, uh, which is um, sexual in certain ways. We have certain needs. Um, there's some objective drives. Uh, there are certain ways that we are, and capitalism keeps us from being who we are. And um, and of course, um, 
sexuality is very much shaped by social forces and, and nowadays um, there's all kinds of critical work around queer studies uh, which uh, which has criticized that very much and so um, after the after the war uh, we see a number of um, theoretical movements which go away from that first uh, moment of critical theory and um, and both have a new way of seeing the subject and uh, society and um, and there are two alternatives uh, in a way to um, to uh, go further than um, than critical theory. The first one, um, well, um, put the emphasis on objective power structures, and um, there's a strand of social realism in the social sciences, which was this, uh, especially popular in in linguistics um, after the war. Um, there's Chomsky, for example. Who, who pointed out the role of the industrial political um, uh, complex. Um, uh, CDA um, too, to some degree, likes to um, have recourse to a realist idea of um, power as, as an objective um, structure that is hidden uh, behind discourses, as it were. And, um, and But there are also, of course, other uh, developments um, in sociology and uh, political science and um, education. Um, I think um, most of the so theorists have become more constructivist in the orientation, and the second generation of critical theorists around Habermas, of course, have been very uh, open to those uh, social, socially constructivist um, strands, uh, including qualitative research um, and so on and so forth. Um, the other uh, development that we've seen over the last few years, um, decades, is uh, around the subject and um, and uh, one um, strand has um, has developed that basically um, adopts a very rationalistic um, uh, idea of a subject as the universal capacity to um, think and judge properly. And um, in many cases, there's the idea there's an objective order of good um, um, arguing of good um, um, values. And um, and uh, I think the most famous uh, representative, of course, is, um, is Jürgen Habermas of that. But we also see another strand of theorizing, um, which um, goes away from the idea that uh, desires and affect are situated or placed within the subject. Um, and the idea is that we need to account for affect and desire as something which is a property of discourses, of social structures, dynamics, of um, of uh, whatever constitutes um, um, us as speaking beings, um, so everything that uh, that is social in a way, and um, and that's um, of course a very important uh, development in uh, post-humanist psychoanalysis after the war. And um, early French discourse analysis was influenced by that to some degree. Um, there's the influence from Lacan, for, for example. And uh, in Peugeot, you see the articulation of, um, of, of, of Marxist with uh, Lacanian ideas around uh, subjectivity. And the idea here is, of course, that the subject is an effect of discourses and, um, and, um, and, and not uh, its origin. Now, I think um, all these influences and backgrounds are important. And um, we need to um, think about uh, how to respond to the specific theoretical challenges in our um, moment today. Um, I think um, a crucial turning point in the political ideologies um, of the West was the great financial crisis of 2007-89, when in the Anglophone world, the idea of the free natural market uh, collapsed, which um, of course has been extremely important to right-wing movements um, in, in the Anglophone world ever since, uh, before. And, um, and so in a way, uh, they realized that the market doesn't really uh, work. It is rigged as it has been um, stated in many uh, forums of, um, of, of, of right-wing and uh, conservative uh, uh, um, discussions. And, um, and uh, the kind of, neoliberal uh, free market uh, strand of, of uh, conservative thought has has in a way petered out and um, I mean what's what's been left is uh, the kind of nationalistic sexistic uh, sexist and racist um, stuff that um, that has always been important for them so um, um, and I think what's important is to go back to the idea that discourse is not just about the rational exchange of arguments but it's really very much about 
dynamics that go around um, contradictions, um, unresolved problems, um, um, tensions uh, that are really social and which are situated not in the subject um, as some kind of hidden container of ideologies and, and, um, and experiences, but they're really placed on the level of discourse. And um, what I want to do now is to turn to, to discourse, uh, to, to Brexit discourse, and um, think about um, how to, to analyze Brexit um, discourse in terms of, of that idea of fascism 2.0, that is as a contemporary development, especially in social media, um, that mobilizes affects for very um, exclusionary and discriminatory purposes. And uh, um, I think we really need to reconceptualize our ideas of, of discourse. Now, if, if we have a look at Brexit discourse, that's, of course, a very specific debate in the UK. It is a bit different from um, um, other debates, like, for example, around Trump, um, where, where right-wing discourse has been very much more focused on the populist leader, uh, which doesn't really, who doesn't exist in, in the case of the UK that much. Um, there have been various actors like Nigel Farage, um, now Boris Johnson, who have tried to um, to surf with a wave, right? But it's very clearly not um, controlled by them. So Brexit discourse is something that happens uh, very much more um, in an undefined media area, which includes many social media, um, not only Facebook and Twitter, uh, but also the um, newspapers in the in, in the UK. Um, you may know that the newspapers uh, in the UK um, have long played a very um, aggressive role um, in um, in whipping up sentiments, resentment against the European Union that started uh, around 40 years ago. And um, and uh, UK newspapers have um, a long history of um, of being very much right wing, at least some of them. And um, and so um, there are other uh, media like uh, television, which has been more liberal, um, even though that might be changing a bit. And um, and there's also very uh, important other conditions for such discourses to develop, which we certainly shouldn't uh, forget, like the electoral system. Of course, um, we talk about um, actors here acting in a political space, which is uh, framed and um, structured by certain institutions, rules and uh, mechanisms, and they respond to them all the time. So um, there are lots of things that um, I won't go into, which I think are very important to understand in order to understand why there's such a hype around uh, Brexit and the European Union in the UK. And um, I, I just want to show um, this um, this graph here, which is the, um, um, the polls that have been taken around is uh, Brexit um, a good or a bad thing or do you regret do, do you think it was a good thing or a bad thing to vote uh, for Brexit in 2016 and what you can see here is um, I mean first of all it's remarkably stable uh, you see the two camps those who think that Brexit is good and others um, uh, think it's bad um, the um, Remainer camp, uh, now the Rejoiner camp, or however you want to call them now, is um, is uh, increasing slowly um, uh, from parity, more or less, um, or, or slight uh, minority uh, around 2016 into 2017. They now have, I mean, a sizable lead, um, whatever that means, right? Um, but, um, I mean, you, you still get the impression here from representations like this one that there are two different blocks, um, like big troops um, standing in front of each other and um, being entrenched in warfare over a long time. And uh, one side is moving very slowly against the other. And, um, and I, I think that's um, quite... Um, a problematic representation of discourse. And it's very common in many discourse and little representations that we have. I just want to, to cite one example, and there are many more, um, like Lau Mouffe's theory of hegemony is very much uh, around that idea that um, hegemonies are constructed around certain um, places uh, and then they become bigger and bigger or they erode and they collapse. And then at some point, uh, political power is taken over. Now, um, 
what what I think is uh, is correct that we have certain procedures to um, to make decisions in um, in uh, democratic societies, which um, which Luc Boltonski called a preuve. And so the idea in, in Luc Boltonski is that um, there are all kinds of processes, practices, there's struggle and competition, and there's lots of heterogeneity between different um, b- between different struggles. Um, but at some point, um, certain things need to be decided, and um, there's an election, for example, and then things are made official, um, they're accepted as established, and that makes a big difference. Um, or, I mean, in, in very different uh, arenas, it's about um, getting a diploma, becoming a linguist, I mean, when, when you finish your, your PhD, for example, and then um, you're officially accepted as, um, as, um, as a PhD in, in linguistics. And, uh, and, and that, that, of course, um, I think is an important point because it reminds us of the many um, flows and um, um, and practices and developments that are all also important, which you don't see in, in such representations. So what does Brexit discourse look like? Um, this is a picture from the Tultepec uh, San Pablito market in 2016. Uh, San Pablito is um, uh, in Tultepec uh, in Mexico. And, um, and Tultepec is, uh, I think, uh, the place where the production of fireworks has the, the greatest economic significance. I think 65% of the population produces fireworks. And from time to time, there is an explosion. And um, this is um, uh, when the fireworks market exploded. And um, you see all kinds of barrels, one after the other, kind of going uh, going up and um, all kinds of different and, um, and yet another barrel and yet another uh, color and it's it's um, it's very tense. I mean, a very high level of intensity, and uh, it's very difficult not to observe this and be fascinated, captivated by that. Um, at the same time, of course, it uh, it wreaks havoc. Um, uh, I mean, very great destruction on on the environment here, and uh, this will of course uh, mean a, a major damage to many people. Um, and that's, I think, um, a very precise. Um, uh, idea of what Brexit uh, discourse is um, outside the um, uh, the moment of épreuve of la prueba in Spanish, I think, uh, when some things are decided, um, it's really about um, dynamics that are uncontrollable. Um, it's about affects that are mobilized in a very uh, spectacular way sometimes, and um, it's about high temperature. And um, and not necessarily about um, the ideas that circulate. And um, what I want to do now is, I mean, I I said, I mean, that the idea of fascism as something which is between the kind of micro desires and some and identity projects um, to control the desire of others. I want to go into the um, uh, forum of the Daily Mail here and have a look at um, how Brexit discourse is constructed here among users of um, of the mail uh, around Brexit uh, articles. Now, again, I mean, the mail uh, is, is a very specific newspaper, which I, I need to explain a bit. Um, the Daily Mail is um, a large newspaper which um, produces an, a tremendous amount of journalistic content. It is known to be uh, the leading Tory newspaper. Um, They have a mix of um, political coverage. Um, They're very well informed about Tory politics and um, and, uh, the level of journalistic quality here is really uh, quite high sometimes. They also have um, the Tory commentariat, um, quite influential, powerful uh, commentators, which um, uh, sometimes have used the mail to to engage in rather extreme right-wing um, ideas, but the mail is definitely not uh, like the Daily Express, um, a Nazi propaganda uh, newspaper. Um, they they do have real journalism, and this is mixed with um, royals. This is mixed uh, with naked tits, all kinds of stuff, which uh, which makes it uh, a bit um, of a large platform for all kinds of different things, and. Um, and Brexit discourse here um, is um, a very um, important uh, because, of course, it's been pushed uh, from the Tories. And um, 
and the, the Mail has, uh, has, has given some extensive uh, coverage uh, about uh, uh, Brexit. And uh, the interesting thing in the Mail is that they have a forum for the users where you can sign up very easily. I mean, most people do it uh, anonymously. And uh, so they have some avatars. And this is not moderated. Many other journal, uh, newspapers don't have that possibility where people can just throw out things, right, without um, much filter. Uh, the Guardian doesn't allow it. Uh, the Independent, uh, which are the two major liberal left kind of left of center uh, newspapers, um, they 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 don't have major forums. And um, and I think uh, the other right wing um, outlets either. So I think the mail is really quite. Um, quite uh, interesting in that respect. Uh, so uh, alongside uh, Twitter and and um, and Facebook, uh, this is a major source of um, uh, where people can can get excited and and comment on on politics. Now, I took this article here just as an example. Um, and um, this was from a week ago. Uh, about uh, one of the latest uh, twists and turns in the Brexit negotiations. And um, it reads here the title, EU demands that banks move jobs from the city to the continent. And um, what you can see here is that within two hours, there are 1,600 comments uh, from, from the readers, which is really quite, um, quite important, given especially the fact that uh, the paper version of the mail has been going downhill, like many other newspapers over the last uh, few years. Um, I think they have lost about 80% of their print run in the last 10 years. And um, But you see certain contents here on, 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 on the online version, which really attract a lot of a lot of attention. And I can tell you that whenever there's something about Brexit, I mean, there's just a peak, there's a festival of comments and reactions, and um, it's, uh, it's worth having a look at that. Um, there are many other articles in the mail, and, um, and you can see a clear kind of concentration of interest. I mean, uh, the reason why, why, why the mail um, covers the royals is because that also um, uh, attracts a lot of interest. And, um, and that's a problem, by the way, for The Guardian, who refuses to go to that level, but they, they just lose a lot of people. Now, if we have a closer look at, um, at the forum of this article, and every article has a forum of its own, um, it will continue for a few days, um, mostly for a week or so, five days, uh, while the article is being modified and updated. So um, the content changes. Uh, people go on commentating um, in the same thread. And, um, and so what we can see in, in, in this forum here is um, there's very clearly the construction of the Remainer and uh, the Brexiteer, or I should perhaps say the Ramona, because normally Brexiteers or pro-Brexit voices talk about the other side as uh, Ramonas. And um, I mean, there's lots of, can you see the presentation? All of a sudden it's gone. Yes, no, we can see it. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So um, there's uh, lots of uh, quibble, quibbles, uh, arguments uh, uh, between Brexiteers and, um, and Ramonas. Uh, one saying, hey, you Brexiteers, we thought beyond your four brain cells. And then Brexiteer, how long does it take for these guys to accept they lost? Get over it. Now, those things are repeated many, many, many times. Get over it. Get on with it. That's a formula which is really very important, and you can see it millions of times. And, um, and of course, what happens here is that people, um, they don't know who they're talking to because everybody is more or less anonymous here, like Face the Truth in my house, United Kingdom. And, um, and But very clearly, there is the construction of a subject position uh, which people recognize very, very easily after a while of um, the pro and the anti-Brexit voice. There are lots of other um, entries where this is not that clear. There's lots of witticism, creativity, um, playfulness, irony, where you just don't understand where they stand really in this kind of antagonism. But the antagonism is really, really very real to everybody who, who takes part in this, um, in this discourse. And that is really interesting. So if you have a look here, for example, um, there's a reaction um, directly to to the article where where it says EU demands 
um, that banks uh, move to to the continent, right? And then um, a very typical reaction from Brexiteers is bully boy tactics. And then immediately there's a reaction from a Ramona, merely delivering on what you voted for. And then again, there's this idea of, of a war, of a conflict where where war is replayed, um, like the Second Second World War. The more the EU bully um, and demand to do what they want, the bulldog will resist. Um, and that's very metaphorical and very clear what it means, I guess. Uh, the first reaction here is maybe not quite that clear, even though I'm pretty sure it's a Brexiteer reaction. The bulldog had been neutered and muzzled. It's a bit strange uh, to hear that from a Brexiteer because uh, normally uh, they will say um, the EU is very much um, uh, a very powerful actor. But you will see right away that um, this is not always the case. And again, I mean, there's a Ramona. So what we see in the forums is in many cases, there's a certain ideological button which is pressed. And then there's a cascade of these reactions, uh, very hard to stop from both sides. And it depends on the ideological button, whether they're more Brexiteers, more Ramonas. In this case, uh, we see lots of Brexiteers. Not that many uh, Ramonas, uh, but in general, um, there's a very, very uh, strong presence from anti-Brexit people here in, in the Daily Mail. It's not just Tory people. Uh, it's not just Brexiteers. And um, and so I can't see that there's uh, this kind of bubble uh, where everybody is just uh, talking to, to oneself. And uh, there's very much uh, an interaction between both sides. Now, um, the important point now to get back to the idea that Fascism is something that mobilizes our desires to control the desire of others. And the major mechanism in Brexit discourse to control the desire of others is through double binds. Now, we don't have the time to go through that systematically. But what, what I do want to point out here is um, a strong uh, an important number of double binds in Brexit discourse. Uh, what is a double bind? A double bind... Um, was first discovered or theorized by um, uh, Bateson in the 50s, uh, who's uh, today known as the Palo Alto School. Maybe it's um, uh, it's uh, it's no longer that uh, well known. And um, and Bateson theorized uh, what's happening in communicative patterns in families, where he pointed out certain messages um, which are fundamentally contradictory and um, irreconcilable. Uh, um, uh, uh, between parents and children. And um, the example he gives is um, uh, the com communication between a parent and a child where uh, the parent invites the child to, to, to show his or her love. Uh, then the child shows it. And then um, the parent uh, rejects the, the kind of message, uh, the response from the child, because um, the child shouldn't respond to the invitation to show love, right, but should do it on its own. Now, um, that's a kind of very difficult situation for the child, of course, to respond to this double demand of showing um, um, love, but not responding to, uh, to this invitation. Um, however you react in such a situation, um, you, um, you're in the wrong. And, um, and so um, a double bind is something that, um, that can be very uh, difficult uh, in the long run. I mean, it can um, uh, cause uh, psychological harm and uh, damage. Um, it's, um, I think, an aspect of uh, pathologies in families. And, um, and now, of course, um, that mechanism is, is not something that you can react to in um, in a good way. And uh, it is um, an instrument in order for the parent to protect um, them from a certain problem that they don't want to face or to address and to, to put the blame and the problem on the ch child. And, um, and so it's really very much about uh, something which is not uh, explicit in discourse. And um, I want to, um, to, to use this idea of some irresolved conflict um, that can't be faced or confronted um, as being the fundamental um, structure around which a certain discourse um, works. And, um, and this is, uh, I think, what we can really see in Brexit discourse very, very often. Um, and I give just three examples uh, from this uh, forum here. The first one is um, the topos of the EUSSR. Um, the EUSSR is a Brexiteer 
label given to the EU, which conveys two ideas basically, and which are fundamentally um, um, uh, contradictory. One idea is that the EU is weak. Um, it is so weak that it's good to be the first ones to, to have quit. And so the idea here is that um, the EU is a collapsing protectionist club or bureaucracy. Um, the other idea that is conveyed with the uh, label of USSR is the EU is a dictatorship bullying nation states. So the EU is too strong, um, and that's why we need to leave. Right? It's um, it's a it's 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 um, it's 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 a dictatorship which we need to leave, and um, and so whatever you respond, you will always be in the wrong because. Uh, the Brexiteer uh, position will be switching from one side to the other. And it's very, very difficult to to have any kind of rational argument and an exchange here um, to, to respond to those um, concerns. Another double bind is the double bind uh, around Global Britain. Now, Global Britain, I didn't find it here in this forum. This is really a slogan that was invented by Boris Johnson in his uh, last electoral campaign. And uh, But you can definitely see um, the double bind as it works out here in the forum. Um, the one message that is conveyed here is that um, once the, the UK is out and unshackled from all EU ties, uh, we will make deals with other nations freely and everybody will be sovereign and we will just uh, do our business as free sovereign nations. So that's one message that is uh, given. The other is um, deals are by definition uh, treason. And um, and whenever there's somebody doing a deal, like Theresa May, who's the arch um, uh, traitor in, in, in this discourse here, uh, whenever a deal is done, this is done by Remainers, and this is a conspiracy um, to thwart the will of the people. Now, again, I mean, we see a, a double bind at work, which uh, puts the respondent in an impossible, um, in an impossible uh, position. And the last double bind I want to show here, which we definitely see so many, so many times here in the material, is no deal. No deal is a very quick, snappy slogan again, and um, it transports um, two ideas. The first idea is uh, that no deal is such a formidable threat um, that you need to present no deal as a negotiation tactic in order um, to um, bring the EU to reason so that they will blink given in the last minute. And then um, the other message is, oh, no, no deal. Um, it doesn't really make a big difference. We will be just fine. And uh, I mean, it's not that important anyway. And, um, and so these messages are, are uttered from the same um, subject positions, of course. And it's very, very um, easy for, 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 for the people who are invested in this discourse to switch from one to the other. And that really drives um, remain people crazy. And um, it is impossible to deal for them with that kind of um, um, fluidity of discourse because they always uh, will be on the wrong foot. And um, and of course, I mean, following Bateson's idea about uh, why we see those double binds uh, at work, um, it's really something, it's not about the arguments here. It's very much about um, the underlying impossibility to come up with any policy proposal on, on the Brexit side. And, um, and this is really what, um, what um, leads this discourse to come up with these um, contradictory messages. And, um, and, uh, and the problem of the impossibility of doing something is uh, in a way uh, put and, and uh, blamed on the Remainers. And uh, so in a way we see a shift of that uh, problem towards the Remainers and uh, and that's why it's not really about um, the arguments here, and it's not even about the impossibility of coming up with any kind of a policy proposal, but it's really about seeing Remainers um, uh, um, um, cringe and um, and seeing Remainers um, um, struggle with that kind of discourse, and that's the the in, uh, the effective uh, enjoyment that um, that people who, who who take part in this discourse really take out of the discourse. Um, now, um, that's something that definitely is uh, not something that we can uh, deal with with a rationalistic uh, approach to discourse. And I want to conclude here, and I don't think I have a lot of time left. Um, so one thing I'd like to say to conclude is um, we need to um, take the limits of reason and political discourse um, seriously as something that we should address, um, of course, 
um, in analytical ways. And um, and I, I find this is quite a challenge. I myself, I'm not um, accustomed to that kind of um, um, object and, um, and, and, and challenge. And um, I want to invite you to, to think about that. Um, I, I think what, what is important to see um, those um, uh, those tendencies uh, of, um, of of affective discourse uh, against the background of um, of how those discourses work uh, more broadly. Uh, I mean, as I said, I mean, you can't really talk um, to to people who are sucked into this kind of fanatic um, discourse. Um, and it's really very much about um, um, their way of exercising affective control over you, right? So that's really the problem. And it's very difficult to, to, um, to deal with this problem. Uh, the problem is, of course, that um, those uh, shitstorms that, um, that are now produced on a daily basis, um, not only by the Daily Mail, but by many um, social media platforms, um, this is something which is engineered in a systematic way, um, and it mobilizes a lot of resources, and, um, and this is exploited in many ways. Yeah, And I just uh, remind you that the Daily Mail would probably not survive, um, even though they, they don't have bad journalistic content in, in the article, but they attract and... Um, and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and and keep readers by creating those uh, shitstorms, which of course they don't control officially, right? And the other thing is, of course, those um, those platforms are just, I mean, a great a great way for new political actors to establish themselves. I mean, the celebrities that um, uh, that want to make a difference in political life, uh, they go for those debates, right? And around Brexit, where there are lots of uh, comments, and not for those where there's almost no comment, like food banks or whatever. And um, and so um, this has some real effects on the way that media and politics works. And we can't ignore the, the realities that are con constituted in these dynamics that mobilize so many people. So um, my last two points are about um, one theoretical challenge and um, one political practical challenge. The theoretical challenge, I think, in, in, in working around affect desire and the kind of limits of reason is to what degree um, can we have a symmetry of explanation, right? Um, of course, I want to give you a rational account of uh, what's happening in, in, in discourse. And I talk about very um, non-rational dynamics in discourse. Now, it would be quite a problem for us if we are in the position of reason to talk about the others who are in the position of um, pure affect and desire. And, um, and of course, um, there should be some sort of symmetry of explanation um, that uh, recognizes that we too, of course, um, are driven by affects and um, that uh, reason is not um, uh, a monopoly of um, academic observers or a certain political uh, strand. Um, now, this is, uh, I think, um, a challenge that's not that easy because I think I do think there's a difference of quality and nowadays between um, the way that Trump speaks, for example, and that uh, Biden or um, Podemos speaks, right? So um, I, I, I don't think that we can just put them all in the, into the same um, uh, uh, basket. Uh, but I think we also should do some good empirical research on, on those less spectacular discourses and see to what degree affects and desire come in and to really have um, an account of discourse um, for various objects uh, where, where affect is mobilized. The other thing is about what should we do, what should be done about um, these discourses, which obviously uh, pose a lot of problem and um, they're highly destructive um, for the institutions, for the way that we live together, and um, for the way that we organize society. Now, um, I think the most- I'm in airplane mode, oh. so I can't help you with that at the moment. Sorry, uh, that was my phone. Um, so um, I guess the first thing is to try to deflect the attention towards other topics. It's very difficult to calm people down if, if you enter their game, right? And that's exactly what they want. They, they want to see Remainers, liberals, urban elites, whatever they call them, uh, snowflakes, wokes, 
PC people, they want to see them suffer. They want to see them under their control and uh, cringe, right? So, um, I mean, that, that, that will just add to the fuel and the fire that, um, that drives those discourses. So, so I think um, it's important that you shift the tension towards other topics. And what's, what's happened, for example, is um, there's more discourse now about climate change. But of course, uh, there are certain limits to that. And what can we do as academics? Very little. Uh, we should also be aware, of course, that there's so many um, areas where we can draw some positive affect uh, from which are not necessarily in political discourse. I mean, uh, we can make music, um, we, we can make love, we can do all kinds of very good and positive things. And um, I think uh, we should kind of understand uh, what are the positive affects uh, of people in their everyday lives, which of course in discourse analysis is very difficult because we don't uh, have access to those um, to those areas. Uh, but then, I mean, there are also of course um, the importance of of institution, uh, which we should, I think, really um, um, underline. And um, I, I just uh, recall the very interesting discussion uh, Turn and and Chavi had yesterday around um, 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 controlling discourse or not. And I think it's really important to think about uh, the question uh, to what degree we can uh, control those uh, debates. I, I guess um, some of the stuff that we can see here is really not about um, argumentation, some common good that we all need to be part of. It should be seen much more in terms of of addiction, right, uh, where medical discourses have no problem um, 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 preventing people uh, from taking drugs, for example, um, or in terms of um, uh, monopolization as well, right? I mean, these discourses sometimes they are really monopolizing the attention of so many people in so few actors and celebrities. And uh, in, in the economic realm, it's no problem at all to um, to uh, work against um, cartels and um, there's regulation of uh, of markets. And I think we should think about those things for discourses as well. So discourse is not just um, uh, something about valuable ideas and ideologies. There's other things like affects and, um, and desires which are not always uh, positive, which uh, should be dealt with in, in similar ways. And as a last remark, perhaps, yeah, we should also recognize uh, the civilizing effect of institutions and defend them. And um, I mean, I, speaking as a European um, living and working in the UK now, um, I think um, the fact that we have the European Union um, is a very important and valuable thing because um, it has been able to deal with all those different um, movements uh, in, in a quite um, good and successful way. Um, it's been very much calming down spirits, which I think is important in this situation. And um, it's been doing this in a very democratic and peaceful way. And I think um, that's also something that, um, that should be said. Um, and that's from me for today. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Johannes, for such an insightful presentation. Um, so we have some time now for questions from the audience. So I will repeat, you can send your questions um, via the chat box option. You can send them in Spanish, you can send them in English, um, or you can use the hand icon to indicate um, that you'd like to ask a question directly. Okay, we have a question from Chavi. Go ahead, Chavi. Hello. Hi, Chavi. Very interesting, Johannes. Very interesting. Uh, very, um, my uh, neurons are excited. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the affect that I want to arouse, right? Yeah, I mean. Good, good. Um, I also have been thinking about this uh, affective dimension. Um, Actually, I think it's not only uh, attached to right-wing thinking or ultra-right-wing thinking, it's also attached to uh, left-wing and extremist left-wing thinking. Well, everywhere there, is, there are affects, yes? As we were saying yesterday, affects as an uh, empty signifier too. But uh, actually, empty just 
temporarily because it's a straight away filled with the feelings of each one and with the desires of each one. Yes, good. So, and, and, and that's why also um, uh, when I talk to my students, I say, well, we, we cannot just confront uh, these ideas uh, um, of the Nazis, let's say, with another idea. Just, just de-rationalize. As I said yesterday, when you demonstrate something to them, they say, that's your opinion. No, I have demonstrated. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's also very similar what you said about this. I didn't know this uh, double bind. It, it was uh, similar to my idea of thinking of their, of their complex of feelings and ideas as a boat or as a system that uh, when in, there is a hole in one place, they, they bring another pace for another and put uh, something to stop that hole, the leak. Yeah? So they mm -hmm. always, maybe, maybe it, it works in couples or maybe it works in triples, doesn't matter, but they always have something to mend what is a, is a, is a hole. So then, then I said, we also need to put emotions, affects in this. Actually, when I was in the States, uh, sorry I, because of my long speech, but I don't pretend to make a long speech. I'm just bringing, when I was there, uh, I had been a journalist for several years already, but uh, it was, uh, I was impressed, mm, not exaggerating, but uh, when they, um, I, I took an MA in journalism and public affairs, and they said, how do you have to make your videos? And they said, you have to put something moving in it, not just explain, put something moving. So emotions, yes. And I said, we, we, these people from the left, it's, it's just it's too serious. There's boring people, yes. Let's bring some emotion to this. Let's bring more of solidarity, yes. So I, I do agree with this. And I think that in our um, discourse, we need to discourse, not in the discourse of the academics, in the discourse, in the in, in the campaigns, in the disc, in the public discourse, in the journalistic discourse, we have to bring. Actually, people do. You know, people do. With um, people put emotions on it. So, in a way, intu intuitively, we are doing it. We are doing it. However, however, we can put emotions into it. But if the material conditions do not change, what is the fanatic discourse of a small minority will find a fertile soil in the vulnerable layer of the society with this possessed, the, those who have been damned, damned is the word, damnified uh, by, by the crisis. What do you think about this? Uh, sorry for the long question. Yeah, thank you very much for your comment. I'm very glad so, um, to, to see you, first of all, here and um, to hear your comment. Um, I think this is really a good um, point um, to, to, to remind us of the positive um, value of affects. Um, and I mean, in this very context, speaking about the extreme right or the kind of Brexit stuff, um, I would say that uh, our reaction would be to calm them down, right? So that it kind of fizzles out at some point. Um, but I, I definitely don't have the idea that uh, affect is bad per se. I think that would be a very, um, I mean, a strange idea. I mean, there can be very positive affects um, um, and and affects, of course, are very important to mobilize people, um, as you say. And, um, it, and that's why it's becoming so important, right? It's been used by political actors. It's been, been used by us as well. Um, to to advance uh, political uh, ideas, and um, and we need to recognize it. So it's um, I mean I, I don't want to come up with a general um, strategy here, and just to respond to this very empirical project. Just just a small thing to add. It's yeah. A small thing. To add. Um, a few months ago, I was talking with a friend of mine, and and I and. And the way the thing was, why she, she I asked, was telling her that someone asked me, why do we get involved in things, in movements? And, and, and I said, because our sense of justice. And she said, no, 
No, it's because our sense of solidarity with the pain of others. Mm -hmm. And I think she was right. Mm -hmm. And that's affect. That's yeah. affect. Just that, just that. So let's not renounce to that. No, no, no. Yeah. Thank you. And I understand, I mean, as it was now, um, I came across as a kind of nerdy, uh, kind of perhaps even technocrat, right, um, to, to kind of criticize that. But uh, that's definitely not, uh, I think, uh, the route that, that I would to suggest. I, I totally agree with you. And I, I do need to say, I mean, the question of affect and desire, it's still a new uh, problem for me. So I, I need to keep thinking about it. It's, um, it's a difficult one. So following um, this conversation about, you know, the affect on the left as well, um, I actually have a two part question for you, Johannes. Um, so first, I, I kind of want you to to go into it a bit more of um, this definition of microfascism as the desire to control the desires of others, um, why this is specific to fascism and not to say other movements that might be on the left um, that might want to change individualistic desires into ones of solidarity, for instance. Um, so that on the one hand, and then also, um, I think it was fascinating how you showed these instances of the, of the double blind phenomenon in the discourses of Brexiters. Um, but I would like to see a little bit more um, how this is uh, how this serves microfascism. I don't know if you could work that out a little bit more for us. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, for the first point, I agree that um, the desire to control the desire of others is something that we can see in, in lots of different contexts. And uh, what I would uh, say is there's a distinction between some kind of proto-fascist um, desire, uh, which is really that desire which uh, mobilizes um, rules and structures, conventions made by others. And that's a kind of authoritarian um, tendency in fascism. And then there's um, still another tendency which um, which projects the impossibility to act um, of the fascist, right, um, on, on the other, on the opponent. And that's the libertarian kind of um, fascism. So we have different types of um, um, of ways to deploy those desires. And um, it's probably important to distinguish between these different types. And, and of course, um, it would be even more complex if we understand how certain ideologies are mobilized in these processes. I would say that uh, desires are very much pre-ideological, so they can be filled with whatever kind of cultural references or, or, or kind of political histories and traditions. Um, but at the same time, um, um, yeah, of course, they're articulated uh, in so many ways with um, with uh, social and cultural stuff. And um, and in that sense, I, I would say we need to to um, to have a more refined idea of what different types of micro fascist practices are and um, and how they um, crystallize in, in macro fascist regimes. Um, that's that's always uh, very um, uh, precisely um, um, historical and, and, and very social. Your other question is now ho hopefully a bit clearer. I mean, the idea is that um, double binds in a way, they turn around an impossibility, an impossibility that um, the parent or the Brexiteer in this case can't face. In the Brexiteer case, it's the possibility to come up with any uh, coherent um, practical action. And, um, and they uh, basically want to shield themselves from that impossibility by creating um, contradictory messages, which puts the other in a bad situation, it, always on the wrong foot. And that's in a way a protective behavior to, um, to um, keep um, one's own problem uh, protected. And uh, now, I mean, the idea is not that um, that the problem is really important. I mean, it can be any problem that uh, that one side can't really face or address. And then through those mechanisms, it can be passed on to the opponents and uh, it can be used to exercise control over the other person because the control comes in uh, once the other person starts to argue, right? And 
to give arguments to these contradictory messages and trying to respond um, with with a true solution, which is impossible, right? Uh, there's no way you can respond um, to double bind. And, um, and that's how, of course, it's very much about the effect of control. It's not um, the underlying impossibility. It's not even the arguments that are said. It's really uh, the enjoyment that um, the parent Brexiteer has in seeing the other one in that kind of impossible situation. I mean, that's cool. That, I mean, I want to see them cringe. I want to see them winch. And, and you see them say it in these, in these forums all the time. And the name Ramona is exactly that. They just take so much pleasure from that control that they exercise as microfascists um, through double binds on those other people who think they can argue with them. Mm, very interesting. So in this case, we could think of it as a, um, a strategy to control the desire of the other to, to provide a solution or to communicate their, their solution. Right. And yeah. the problem, of course, is um, the other is um, presented as uh, the other with um, universal um, values, um, um, intelligence, um, sometimes beauty, right? Um, that's, I mean, the kind of um, idea behind it. Whereas the Brexiteer is ugly um, and uh, inferior. And, um, and through this pervert mechanism, this is, of course, turned around so that, um, that the limits all of a sudden is, uh, is put on, on, on the other side. And, um, and, and that gives so much enjoyment to, to, to the people who, 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 who get sucked up in the, into that discourse and, um, and they do it. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I mean, that's so dangerous. And, and the more they see, um, arguments, uh, citing, um, the kind of beautiful values from the other side, the, the more mm -hmm. they get entrenched in, in those mechanisms and they see since the double binds work, uh, they come up with ever more uh, contradictory stuff, and um, which at the same time protects them from facing their fundamental incapacity to come up with some workable action, and um, and um, they, they 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 silently observe the others um, uh, suffering, and um, and that's really about the relationship. So I think it's not really driven by some some fundamental racism. Uh, right. Um, it's it's really about that effective enjoyment of seeing those who are against racism and for immigrants uh, suffer. But it's not really against the immigrants directly. Not so much. Right. So mm -hmm. it's it's this kind of um, um, triangular relationship between different um, uh, participants of the conversation where it's not really about the argument at all, but about that idea that, uh, oh, I see you suffer. And that's so cool. And that's the blow in in, in the belly that uh, that we we gave you through Brexit. Right. So this emotional double blind game or double bind game serves as a distraction, which then, of course, um, the media also uh, soaks up because it's interesting. It's sensationalist. Very, very and interesting. Brexit is just so, so um easy to use for that because it is um a very abstract um idea i mean now it's very much focused about very very abstract ideas like sovereignty um it's so abstract in, in, in its idea that it never has to face reality all the kind of um practical ramifications of brexit i mean show that it's just not possible so it's ideal as the ultimate uh, impossibility that allows um the extreme right um, to go into that, those games and uh, destroy, um, um, well, others who who defend values which uh, which are maybe positive. Very interesting. All right, let's see if we have any other questions. We still have a little bit more than five minutes, so please do not hesitate. We have a question from Luisa. Adelante. Hi.
We can't hear you, Luisa. I think your microphone is off. And now we can sorry, hear you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't catch the, the analogy with the fireworks. I missed something there. If you can explain it a bit, little bit, yeah? Because yep. I see something important there, but I'm, I was a bit confused. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, the idea is that uh, we have um, a um, spontaneous idea of discourse um, that we understand as a structured space, right? Uh, there's a structuralist um, notion uh, that is still quite alive to understand uh, Brexit, uh, for example, as um, as a discourse between two sides, right? In a very much um, uh, structured space where there's the Remainer voice, there's the um, uh, Brexiter voice. And, um, and uh, there are lots of, um, uh, I mean, media representations, but also scientific representations of discourse as a structured um, container space uh, where there's one ideological position, idea or set of uh, elements um, c c coming together, right? And then there's the other uh, side or, or three, four, five sides. And, um, and what, what I'd like to point out is that um, discourse, especially around Brexit, which has such high intensity, and that's the entire point, right? To have high effective intensity. Um, this is like a series of micro explosions all the time. Um, it is not really possible to see public opinion represented in these forums, for example. Every time there's a new forum opened up in, in the Daily Mail or in any other uh, social media, we see this clash between positions. We see um, affect building up. Um, it's a firework of, of sensual impressions. Uh, people um, react very directly. Um, um, I mean, it's a little screen that uh, that they're all hooked to. So um, um, my invitation is to to see both sides. Right? We see, of course, um, um, the political um, domesticated uh, products um, of of those processes um, in in elections in um, referenda that we've had right so uh, at some point certain um, um, certain very heterogeneous um, fireworks are put into this kind of uh, one two or 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 yes no only decision and um, but I, I think what we should understand is that before that or around that I don't know um, discourse is very much more it's very much more uncontrollable, very much uh, more going in all kinds of directions. And sometimes it's very hot, very cold. Sometimes it's blue and red. And and um, and uh, the point is um, to capture the um, the affect um, intensity and not so much um, the ideological position. Right. Um, the graph that we saw, uh, I mean, basically reflects or constructs a certain kind of structure of ideological positions, whereas it doesn't show us at all the level of, um, of, of, of affective intensity. And, and, and that needs to be fed all the time. Um, and during the last four and a half years, I mean, there have been so many instances of yet another uh, insane thing, right, uh, which, which was uh, put, put out there. And, um, and so the affect came up. And, and so I'm a bit worried about um, um, Academics and discourse analysts were producing this idea of um, of discourse as a neat space, right, where um, there's a majority and minority. Um, what we need to see is these processes, these spirals um, that uh, draw people in these um, festivals of central central effective experience. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question from Victor. Go ahead, Victor. Oh, yes, this is amazing because that was my question. What can we do in CDA, for example, to capture this? And we cannot. And this is the PhD I'm doing in retirement. I'm looking at Brexit and I'm trying to capture newspaper articles through CDA. And the uh, the explosiveness of, of uh, even the articles, I'm not even looking at the social media, uh, is too much for it. So any thoughts on that? Maybe I could even contact you independently afterwards. I'd be grateful for a notion from you. The contrast for me is that of this, your firework analogy with Gadamer's fusion of horizons, 
it's like boom we just had november the 5th here you know recently fireworks night bonfire night and the sky we're not seeing any horizons at the moment just a thought and yeah, thank you so much yeah what what can we do um i mean first of all i mean we're talking here about huge crowds um getting all excited i mean um there were 5800 um comments on that one article uh by by two days ago um and this is i mean a, a massive reality and and mobilization of energy that is i mean really difficult to ignore and it makes a difference and it makes much more of a difference um, than just a few CDA uh, people um, doing some analysis uh, or kind of intervening with an, an analysis in it, right? Because it's, I mean, our resources are so much uh, smaller and more limited. I, I think uh, what we can do is to, of course, um, create tools and um, uh, models to understand these processes better. Sometimes in the long run, that does make a difference. Um, and I think it's also important to understand, of course, we're all part of these processes. I mean, uh, when we do research on these uh, very contemporary discourses, it is because we are drawn into the effective machines, right? Um, and uh, we have our positions in there and um, and it keeps us working. Um, that's, that's very important. And we are citizens as well in our research, of course. And... Um, and I think uh, one thing we should perhaps do as well is to what degree are we complicit with the whole machine? I mean, because the whole machine is about um, mobilizing effective energy, right? And creating all that kind of incredible crowd of people that gives visibility to a very small number of people who become very, very powerful. I mean, it is something... Uh, that keeps the Tories in power. Um, it's been tried three times now, and it's worked three times. At the same time, of course, uh, they're always in a cul-de-sac, and um, and uh, as soon as they need to act and to come up with a deal, as they call it now, um, it's impossible. So it's possible to come up with something to respond to to the situation, and um, and so um, I mean we are part of a discourse where um, there's a redistribution of visibility. Um, of recognition towards the very few celebrity actors who really need those discourses to um, to to get their share of of the power. And uh, I mean, Trump is even more kind of obvious because I mean he's the one person uh, populist leader, which we don't have in in Brexit discourse that much, right? Um, obviously, uh, Johnson and Farage are much more um, chased and driven. Um, I mean. Uh, they're much less um, uh, active agents, less um, as than 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 passive uh, uh, figures in in this whole uh, chess 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 game. Um, and um, but still, I mean, if if we as discourse analysts talk about this thing, and that's what I did precisely, of course, we just contribute to um, giving them the visibility, the re the relevance that they need precisely. So again, it's very difficult to not only talk to, to with them about a problem like Brexit, um, which I think is normally impossible, but it's even very difficult to talk about it because we need to talk about something else. <laughs> Come out of the academic bubble, I think I, sh I need to uh, get back to social movement building. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Johannes. Truly fascinating talks this evening from both.